undocumented immigrant, none of that matters at all. What matters is that you reside in the United States and that you sleep here, technically sleep here on April 1st of 2020. And this is actually a really important key question that people ask us a lot, especially in light of the Supreme Court case right now about adding a citizenship question to the census. Um, we believe as a partnership that every person should be counted, and I'm gonna get into why. The census is used for apportionment. Um, the, the, the main point here is that everyone in the country is counted, and then they divide up the number of people in America by the, the number of congressional districts, 135. And that's how they figure out how many people belong in each congressional district. There are some states out there that actually stand to gain congressional representation. Texas, for example, might gain up to three. California is looking at one or two, I think. Colorado is looking at one. Illinois, Minnesota are both looking at losing a representative because their populations are dwindling. Um, New York is the same way. Pennsylvania is the same way. So you might not like your state representatives. You might not like your congressmen, but they are yours, and they do speak for you in Washington. So one of the reasons we advocate a complete count is because we want you to have the representation that you're due in Congress. So that's the first thing, apportionment. Um, we draw congressional and state legislative districts and school districts and voter precincts all based on census data. So once the census is complete in 2020, um, July is when the data um, collection ends, and then the census works to crunch a bunch of data and they develop um, a portfolio that they give to the president by December. Um, in 2021, these, the districts across the country will start doing a process called redistricting. And they use this census data to redistrict state house and state senate races, voting districts, school districts, congressional districts, um, which is a really important process for us politically in our country. Um, distribute federal dollars. There are about 800 billion federal dollar, uh, 800 billion federal dollars that gets distributed, and we do it based on the census. So the population that you count in your community really helps impact how many dollars you see, which impacts our bottom line directly. Um, if government planning um, and actually organizational planning um, companies. So Amazon is a good example. Amazon used census district um, this census data to decide to put their new headquarters in Brooklyn and the outside Washington, D.C. didn't work out for them quite the way they wanted to, but they looked at census data to decide that that was a good move for them. Um, voting rights and civil rights legislation, that actually is also impacted by the census because they use the census um, data to determine how frequently they need a polling place in a, in a certain area, um, and they, they use it to count um, to see how many people are voting and to make sure that people are getting access to those elections. I'm going quickly. We do have a lot of slides, but I also want to make sure we have some time for questions. Uh, but if you do have questions, please send them to Liza because she's going to manage that process for us. In your community, the census is important because on a local level, um, if you have one neighborhood that's growing, you have a, a brand new suburb and they have a lot of kids in that neighborhood, that census data that we collect next year might get you a new school because there's a large concentration of children that need an education in that area. And so it helps local governments decide where to put resources like libraries and schools. Real estate developers, city planners, and again, businesses, you're not gonna put your new ice cream shop in a warehouse district. And that census demographic information can be really helpful to decide where you do something like that. So census is important to us for lots of reasons and lots of ways. So the census actually is a bureau that is it's a, a section of the Department of Commerce. It's an independent section. And they actually do work all year round, not just for the decennial. Um, they do the American Community Survey every five years. The decennial is the one where we ask every single person who lives in our country 10 questions. So the census we're doing next year is only 10 or 11 questions. It's very short. It's going to take 10 or 15 minutes to do. It's not the long form that some of you may have received in the mail that asks lots of personal data about how you commit to work. It's nothing like that. These are pretty simple questions. They ask who's in your household. Uh, they ask what your income is, your gender, your ethnicity. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty simple stuff. 
Um, they have been started, they started in March um, of 2018 to finalize the questionnaire, uh, but they've actually been working on this since the year after the last decennial to plan what went wrong, what went right, how do they do the 2020 census. Um, they have been verifying addresses, working with the U.S. Postal Service for the past six months to eight months, and they're starting to open um, census bureaus. So the regional offices are all open, and I will show you a map of those in a, in a minute. Um, and they're about to start opening up to 248 local, um, local offices around the country. The important dates for you to know is that next March, people will be sent um, an invitation to respond online. They, they're hoping that 45 to 60% of the census next year is responded to online, which poses a problem for some of the communities out there that don't have internet access or reliable internet access. Um, the census knows those, those communities and those, those people will be sent a mail form uh, right off the bat. They're not gonna be invited to do online. Uh, but invitations will be sent in March. Then reminders and postcards will be sent. Census day is April 1st. And this is a, the snapshot day I mentioned earlier. This is where you sleep at night. So if you have a split household and you have um, your, your share custody of your kids with your, your former partner, wherever those kids sleep that night on April 1st, that parent is the one who needs to put the kids on the, their census form. Um, sometimes people don't actually, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought for a second. Sometimes people don't respond when they have kids in their household that aren't theirs. So if you're an intergenerational household and your kids or grandkids are staying with you that they're, and they're, it's a temporary situation, some people don't count the children that are in the household. But if they're sleeping there regularly, not just on vacation, not just visiting, but if they sleep there regularly and they're there, they're, they are there on April 1st, it's really important that we make sure that our communities know that they need to count kids. Um, reminder letters will be sent with paper questionnaires if people don't do it online. Postcards, a final postcard will be sent. And then in May, people will start getting knocks on their door. One of the biggest questions we have is that uh, they don't want people to come to their door. They don't want the government showing up on their doorstep. If you fill out the mail or online census, they won't. So the answer is pretty simple right there. 95% um, of households will get their invitation by mail. Some of those places, some of you might have um, communities where you, you don't have mailboxes. Um, some households will have the census taker drop them off. Um, usually census, censuses aren't taken by um, a census taker in person. For the most part, knocking on doors just stirs people to do it themselves. So less than 1% will be counted in person. So, we do have, um, I think it's 420,000 enumerators will be, will be walking around. The census hires hundreds of billions of people, or hundreds of people a cycle, and they're gonna spend $15 billion to complete this count. So this is not an insignificant undertaking. Um, in 1970, the average dollar per household to count was $16, and those are today's dollars. In 2010, it was 92, and today it's 107, and that's a, a hallmark of how difficult the environment has been, become for people to fill out the census. This number is really important, and we have a, a chart that shows what the actual number is for your state, but the overall average is that for every person in your community that is counted, you will receive $2,000 in federal funding for your community. So that money goes for all sorts of federal programs, but it includes TANF and Head Start and um, SNAP benefits, um, LIHEAP money. Um, if, if you have 100 homeless people who don't respond to the census, you're gonna miss out on $200,000 a year, every year for 10 years, in real money that, that your community rightfully deserves, which is one of the reasons why we're so involved this year. Okay. We've talked a little bit about this, and I'm um, being long-winded, so I'm gonna skip a little bit, but how, um, most of you do, a, all of you actually do a community needs assessment. The data is also important for you here because you use the census data to fill out those forms. We're involved in this partnership because our clients are historically hard to count populations. This slide shows a little bit, um, and we'll actually send this out to all of the participants so you'll have time to review this on your own. 
Uh, this slide represents the $77 billion of the $864 billion of total federal program spending that impacts us, um, CCG, MyHeat, Head Start, TANF, um, Child and, and Adult Care Food Programs, Rural Rental Assistance Programs, all of these things, um, it's 9% it's of the federal budget, and if we don't count our people, we won't have our fair share of that money. So why is it so difficult? What are, what's, what's the problem here? Um, the first problem is that we have a very mobile population. So the average um, is 15, 15, 14 to 18% of, of Americans av on average move every year. So this, we just have a transient community. Um, in our communities, the Community Action Network, it's more like 30% because people lose their, they get evicted, they lose their jobs. People who are, are in poverty tend to move a lot more often. Uh, we have a lot of informal complex living arrangements. So I mentioned the split households earlier, but we also have intergenerational households. We also have immigrant households that have multiple families living under one roof, um, which makes things difficult. You can actually get additional census forms if you have um, communities like that. Uh, so each household, even if there are four households living under one roof, they should each fill out their own census form. But that leads to undercounts quite a bit. Um, there is a current budget fight going on about census dollars. Um, we're, trying, um, we're trying to figure out how much money they're actually going to have, but it looks like we're going to get shorted about a billion dollars. Um, the rapid change in use of technology is also an issue. These days, everyone's tied to their phones. They have Twitter, they have Instagram, they have Snapchat, they have Facebook, you have emails, you get notifications about who knows what. So actually breaking through the clutter of the inundation that everyone has today with the rise of information um, and technology has been really difficult. Um, so it's, it's hard to get through to people to tell them that they need to do this and why it's important. And all the census postcards might get lost in the mail. Um, there is also a growing distrust in government and that's not just in immigrant populations, it's overall in the country, um, which means that, that people start to get more private, they start to um, clam up a little bit and be a little bit more wary of telling the government anything. This slide shows us um, about um, the people who are hard to count and, and why they might be. Some of them are hard to locate. Um, some people want to remain hidden. Um, there's a lot of suburban builds going on in, in urban areas, um, so those households are new and they might not be on a list of, of mailing addresses. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation about the, the, the census. So people who are misinformed or undocumented might be hard to persuade. Um, if you don't speak English as your first language or you have low literacy or if you don't have internet, you might become hard to interview. Um, homeless people are hard to contact. Uh, you don't know where they are any given day. Um, Trains and communities are also hard to contact because they're hard to find. So these four things are, are, are some of the things that make people hard to count, and you can be all four. You don't have to just be one, which makes our community a little bit more difficult. This is a slide we pulled together from um, some census documents highlighting who is hard to count. And if you'll notice that the one thing about this slide is that uh, all of these people fall into our categories of clients. This is just a nice little way for us to depict that graphic. Okay, so what I think I've outlined the problem. We have to count a lot of people and there's, uh, there are a lot of barriers in our way. So what are we doing about it? First thing is that we have the census. The Census Bureau is out there and they are spending 14 or $15 billion to do this count. Um, again, there are eight, seven or eight regional offices and then there will be 248 individual offices scattered around the country. So there should be one near you. They're also partnering with um, communities and people um, around the country. We encourage you to go to the, the U.S. Census website and partner with them. Um, you'll get emails once or twice a week about the importance of the data, what the data does for us, um, to, and uh, to help you understand what the data is used for, so you can explain it to people in your community. Um, it also talks about landmarks and, and deadlines and, and things like that, so it's a good way to be informed. 
here are the regional offices. Um, so Denver, Chicago, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles are the regions. We have information for all the all the regions. There are regional contacts. So if somebody is interested in reaching out to the census, we can go straight to the regional offices today. Liza, do we have? Um, can we throw the slides in with each individual office and the and the contact information before we send this out? Sure. Also, it's it's accessible for everybody at um, the Census Bureau website. Um, you could they have a map where you can see um, all the regional offices and then also um, the area offices within your state. So we'll make sure that that link is included when we send it out to everybody as well. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So the census has these regional partner offices. Um, they're also doing what's called complete count committees. I know I mentioned this a little bit before. Um, many states have already formed statewide complete count committees. Um, and we are encouraging all of our locations um, on the local level to build a, a complete count committee. So these are, are um, loose organizations between your local government, your faith-based action, um, communities in the area, so the churches and, and mosques and um, synagogues that might be trusted partners in your community, um, along with, with community action. A great example of this, I was in Tennessee a couple weeks ago, and they were about to have a meeting with their mayor the next week for their complete count committee. Um, and one of the asks that the community action network had for the mayor was to talk to the police about not sweeping homeless communities in the days surrounding the count. So they, they, knew, they were planning when the Census Bureau was gonna go out and do their counting of homeless populations, and they wanted to make sure that they were in known locations. So that's something that a complete count committee can do um, it, to help us get our complete count. Um, the Census also has this really great toolkit. It's about 30 pages, it's worth le leaping through. And it's not just good for census, it's good for any kind of community outreach, um, but it gives you an overview of how to go about talking to people about the census and to go about building a partnership in your community. Census Counts 2020. So this is a group um, of 16 hub organizations. You can see the, these are the, the logos for all of them. Um, they are privately funded by a group, um, several of the large foundations um, have pulled together to give each of these entities a pocket of money to come out and do what we're doing. Um, so we have people representing the rainbow of America. So Arab Americans, Asian Americans, LGBTQ, Hispanic, um, all of these people are, are involved in this process. These partners are going and doing their own research and developing their own tools based on what's best in their community. And we're sharing information, so no one person is creating all of the information out there and all the tools that are out there. So the Arab American Institute Foundation, for example, is doing research in their community to figure out the messaging, for example, so what can convince an Arab American to fill out the census. Um, these 16 partners, we have um, pretty much bi-weekly meetings and we get a lot of information from them. Um, they are the Census 2020 Count Hub, the national hub for the 16 partners. Um, the state associations for all of these entities are our state hubs. And then the local action are, would be our community action agencies. Um, and all of these state hubs have other local offices. So one of the things that we're putting together is a way for you to figure out who is part of the Census Count 2020 partnership in your area, so you can reach out to them and build a partnership to work together in tandem to do a complete count. They also have a website um, on, on April 1st of 2019. They launched the Count Me In website, um, sorry, the Census Counts 2020 website. Um, they're adding resources to this website and we're encouraging people to go in and pledge to be counted. Um, in a way, this is a way for you to get more information from them, but it's also to show numbers. So it's a, an, an important step to pledge here to count yourself and to make sure that your community is counted. Uh, Liza, do you want to step in and do this, this next couple of slides? 
Sure. Great. So thanks. We've got a good overview at this point of what is going on um, from both the Census Bureau and the Community Action Counts campaign, which will definitely be informing all of the community action work around census outreach. But as um, a national partner on the Census 2020 campaign, the partnership is also really invested in doing what we can to activate our network and make sure that the people that we serve are getting counted. Um, and so through our work, we are hoping to educate and increase awareness across the network. Um, and that's sort of being done right now um, over the course of May. Lindsay um, and Lil, who many of you are familiar with, our senior associate for training and technical assistance and research, um, and our subject matter experts, Jim, Jim Masters and Alan Stansbury, have been on the road throughout a number of state association conferences um, talking about the importance of the census for their state and really trying to have that in-person touch to every single um, agency about how important the census is for, for their community. Um, we also are hoping to uh, mobilize the network to not only understand the importance of the census, but take action in their communities. Um, and we've got a number of plans to, to do this. Uh, one thing that's in the works that will be launched really soon in, in the idea of um, Lindsay, which is why we're excited to have her as our project director, is to um, form a community action um, specific complete count committee, so a network-wide complete count committee sort of based off of the structure of the uh, census complete count committee, but just for community action where we can ensure that across the network we are mobilized and we are working together to uh, make sure that everybody is counted in our communities. So we're working through the details of that, but we're, we're really excited about um, building that infrastructure for census outreach and, and hopefully maybe something that we can utilize to, to do outreach engagement um, beyond the census. Um, so as we're working on that, we're also um, continuously curating and generating uh, census resources specific to community action. So there's a lot of resources and information out there, um, but, we are, but we know that this is just one more additional thing among the, the number of um, projects and services that community action agencies are working on. Um, so we're working to make sure that you are getting the information that you need um, and the best information for the work that you do. Um, and then we're also going to continually um, train agencies on the, the, the best outreach efforts, the best messaging techniques, the um, most the frequently common, the frequently asked questions. So we'll be equipping agencies with all the tools and um, training that they need to do the outreach at the local level. Um, all of our work is guided by a nine-member um, community action census working group. These representatives are from nine states across the country that represent um, the largest hard-to-count populations. So we've got as diverse as New York to Arizona. So in some cases, the hard-to-count population is really the rural population. Um, in others, it's states with high immigrant populations. Um, and others, of the densely populated urban areas that have a number of um, difficult um, pockets that are hard to count. Um, so they're going to be really assisting us along the way as we come up with tools um, to, to help the uh, networks do this census outreach work. And um, we, or earlier this year, um, on April 1st, which was a year out from Census Day, we uh, uh, launched the, the Community Action Census website. And, um, hold on, just switching over. Here we go. This is the website. Here on this website, we have a lot of the information that we're sharing with you today, some background on the Census Bureau and the work that they're doing to um, help with the outreach, um, the Census Counts campaign background, and some of the work that we're doing. And then we also have a number of resources um, already posted for you to access. And we'll continually update this website. Um, one of the updates that's going to be made within the week is we're hoping to um, post a a sign-up form to collect um, emails for a newsletter that we will be launching um, throughout and will be conducting throughout um, the 2020 census, about a monthly newsletter to keep everybody engaged on what's going on with um, community action census efforts. So um, we, we recommend everybody tuning in to that website, um, signing up for the newsletter 
um, to see, um, to continuously get to see what we're doing at the partnerships to help with census outreach. Um, and Lindsay, I can pass it back to you now to talk a little bit more Great. about how agencies can take all of this information and turn it into action at their agency and in their communities. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So there are several different ways that you can get involved and you can help us in this process. Uh, the first one is to learn about the census in your community. So we've got some tools and resources. Um, the, there, there's a CUNY was given a bunch of census data and we're gonna show you some maps on the next slide um, to help you find where in your community the hard to count people might, might reside. The census also has a, a map that shows low response neighborhoods. Um, so that is also gonna be an, a helpful tool for people to figure out which pockets of, of your, your county, your community um, has a low response rate. So you know where to focus your efforts. Um, once you figure out who and where your population is, you gotta figure out why they're a little bit hesitant to fill out the census. What are their major concerns? Um, we will have some messaging for you for some of, of the population um, through our partners for the census, through Census 2020 partnership. Um, we will have messages that have been tested on some of the communities that you might have that are having trouble um, being fully on board with filling out the census. And we'll be doing webinars on those things and have those resources for you. Um, so figure out where your local census office is. You can invite them to come to your meetings. Um, you can invite them on to, into um, a, a state association meeting. We're partnering with several of them as we've traveled the country to talk to you um, already. But they'll come to your, your, your community action agency for a meeting and they'll talk to people about the census. Um, and when the census day comes, they will have enumerators that can come to your community and help you fill out census forms as well. Um, this is the CUNY map. And so we know that there are 100 people on, the, on today, and I know you're from all over. Um, so we just put up a map of the U.S. to, to kind of give you an idea of where the hard to count reside. But every single state has a pocket of people who are hard to count. Um, some, some of you might recognize that they're along the border. That's a, a difficult area. Um, some of them, you might notice that some of the rural areas are really difficult or some of the tribal areas are really difficult. Um, this map actually goes down from at the state level um, to the census tract level, um, and it goes by county. You can really get into to your area and what um, what your neighborhood looks like. And if you're a data nerd like I am, this is just fun to play with. Um, we encourage everyone to network, partner, connect, and build. One of the opportunities we have with this is to find other people in the community um, that have civic-minded um, actions in place to work with them. And we're hoping that some of you find partnerships that will carry you through the years. Um, you are encouraged to join or form a complete count committee, be a census partner, um, and talk to the local affiliates. And we have some of the data already about the partners that have local offices, and we will have that. And we're encouraging you to recruit to fill census jobs. Um, this actually is, is multifold. Um, census jobs pay between $13 and $23 an hour, depending on where you are in the country. Actually, I think it's 24 um, these are decent jobs. They can be part-time jobs. They can be full-time jobs. Uh, there are also supervisory positions that pay about $60,000 a year. Um, and we serve people who need jobs. So we encourage people to go to uh, the census website. You can just Google census jobs. Um, or, or it's also, I think it's census 2020 backslash jobs. But it's easy to find, and you can encourage your clients to apply for these positions. Um, I'm I've heard on multiple occasions that if somebody is on a stipend, um, it doesn't count against their benefits. So they can do this as well as keep their benefits, um, which is really important for, for our communities, which I know. Um, we're also encouraging people who are on the front lines um, in community action agencies to moonlight as, um, I'm sure EDs won't be real happy with me saying that, but if you can work part-time on the weekends and you can be an enumerator. Um, we're encouraging this because, A, we want our people to have jobs, and these are federal jobs which could help them get a longer-term federal position in the future. Um, we're also encouraging our people in, in every county to apply for these jobs. 
because it makes a lot more sense for a neighbor to be knocking on your door than someone from the big city 200 miles away or somebody that was hired and, and sent into that area. Um, so we want people to, to, be, um, to, to be interacting with people who are local. Um, and the more trusted we can have people talking about the census with populations that are dubious about it, the more positive reinforcement we can give them. Oh, here it is. She snuck, Liza snuck that slide in for me. That's great. Um, the census outreach at an agency level, we will give you that messaging again for the hard to, to count populations. Um, there are some legalities and frequently asked questions. We'll go through some of them at the end of this, um, this presentation. We are working on um, resources that we can post online, so posters that you can uh, print off and hang in your, in your agency, in your office, um, postcard templates that you can print off and have your transportation guys walk around with um, and hand one to each person they give a ride to. We will be giving you the, um, the files for those, those kinds of things to help you have the tools at your hand to interact with your community about these things. Um, we are also here for technical assistance. Um, our email addresses are at the end of this, and I think that um, we're on the website. We're easy to find. And we want to be easy to find. We want to be able to answer your questions. So we encourage you to reach out, um, send us an email, call us, ask us your questions. Um, social media and communications, we are going to have a Twitter feed dedicated to census um, information for the partnership. We are also going to have a, a closed Facebook group. So we're, we'll, it'll be a, a private group that you have to apply to get into. Um, so it's just community action people. Um, and we're just going to do that to start a forum so people can ask questions. So you can come in and say, oh, you know, my client says this about the census and is this true? Or my client doesn't want to fill out the census because of this? Or I have someone who um, speaks a, an unusual language. How do I get them a census form? Um, the answer there is that they're, they're phone lines. But we want to have a community forum so people can ask questions and um, and find answers and, and feel like you're connected to other people who are doing this work. Um, the right messaging is really going to be key for everybody talking to folks about the census. Different hard to count populations will respond to different messaging. So we will be feeding you that information. We are, we've got research out there and we're working on getting that in a format that will be easy to digest for you and to talk to your people. Um, Again, the trust and messenger thing is really, really important. Um, you talk to your clients on a daily basis. They already come to you with some of the hardest things that they need. They need, they need money. They need SNAP resources, lie heaps, all those things. It's hard to come to. So somebody admit, admit that they need that help? And so they already trust you. Um, and so we're, we need to empower our network to talk about the census um, as trusted messengers. Uh, we will have a training video, so we are working on this. Uh, we should have this out in the next couple of weeks, I hope. Um, and it's just a short, quick little five or six minute video that you can share with your, um, with your colleagues um, about the census and why it's important and some of the things that they can do to help us get a complete count. Okay, I promised that we were going to have a few uh, commonly asked questions. Um, that why is the census important? We've gone over this, but the answer for a client asking is that it helps our community get its fair share of federal and state resources. Um, I saw an email from the census this morning that said I think it was either 45 or 47 percent of people don't know that the census is how federal funding is divvied up. Um, so they don't understand that them not answering the census means that their community won't get resources. Do I participate if I'm not a citizen? Yes. Yeah. The Constitution says that every person that lives in the United States gets counted, whether or not they're a citizen. Um, the citizenship question, we won't know if it's going to be on, on the census until the end of June. Um, it is currently in front of the Supreme Court oral arguments for a few weeks ago. Um, we think that they're probably going to wait until the last minute um, to, to issue an answer. Um, for those of you who don't know, Wilbur Ross, who is the Department of Commerce Secretary, added the citizenship question at the last minute um, after the, the forms had already been set, sent to Congress to be approved. Um, so the question in front of the Supreme Court is whether or not that was done legally, um, which is far more complicated than that, but, but 
the oversimplification is that um, the justices were very interested in um, the impact of the citizenship question on the, the overall census. And the estimates say that about 6.5 million people won't return their census forms if the citizenship question is there. Um, our view is that it would be interesting information. Um, however, we also are very invested in a complete count and we want every person in the country on April 1st to be filling out their census forms. Um, regardless of which way it goes, we're gonna do what we're gonna do. Um, it doesn't change our mission. It might change how we go about it a little bit and we're gonna get more information to you as we get that uh, decision from the Supreme Court. Um, what's important about the citizenship question and all of this data for people who are mistrustful is that the, the Census Bureau as a whole um, is, a, is a very professional organization. Um, they are a silo. Information can come in, but information, uh, private information for sure doesn't go out. So they, the data that they publish is an aggregate. Um, it's not tied to a specific person. It's not tied to a specific um, uh, um, individual. It, it's all aggregated data, um, which is one of the safeguards out there. Another one is that Title 13 is a pledge that everybody who works for the census has to take in order um, to start their job. They do it on their first day. And Title 13 says that public, um, public release of information is prohibited by law. And these people are taking this pledge of Title 13 with the understanding that if they um, divulge information, private information about the census, then um, they are liable to, for a $250,000 fine and they can be jailed for up to five years. This is something that everybody at the census takes very seriously. Um, we heard a, a story on the road last week about President Obama, when he was looking to buy a house in Washington, D.C. when he left the White House, uh, was, wanted to know more about information about the neighborhood, and so he contacted the Census Bureau and said, hey, can I have this information? And the census said, no, sir. <laughs> we are not able to divulge that information. Um, so they do take this stuff pretty seriously and a quarter million dollar fine and a five-year prison sentence is nothing to sniff at. Um, do they come to my house? So we went over this a little bit earlier. Uh, no, no they don't if you complete the form online or in the mail. If you don't, then they will come to your door. So if you definitely don't want the feds knocking at your door, you should fill out your form and send it in and you won't have that issue. Um, if you, there, there are 10 or 12, 10 or 11 questions, depending on the citizenship question. Um, if you don't fill out one of those questions, they probably won't come to your door. If you don't fill out two of those questions, you will get a knock because they do not want that information. Um, is it safe for me to provide my information? Um, yes, I have touched on this a little bit. Census data is only used for statistical purposes. It is aggregated. Um, a personal census information cannot be disclosed for 72 years. So I have I've had a couple people say that they use census forms um, from the early 1900s to do genealogy research, which is really cool. It's a really cool thing to be able to find that information. Um, today, the, the standard is that your personal information will not be released for 72 years. So the census forms we complete next year will not be released until uh, the year 2092 when Presumably, it won't matter any, anymore for, um, for any, any reason that somebody might be dubious today about disclosing that information. Can I help someone fill out their census form? Oh, we're going to have a lot more guidance on this one because this is a question that comes up quite a bit. Um, the, the short answer is yes, you can help somebody um, get online and pull up the proper form. You can review the form with them before they fill it out to make sure that they know what the questions that they're going to be asked will be. You can also connect them to a census hotline. So I think that the one thing we haven't really touched upon is that there are three different ways to fill out the census. Um, you can go online and fill out your form. Everyone gets a unique identifier code in, in the mail and their postcards. Um, so you can, you can go online and do that. You can fill out the form via mail. And this year we're going to have a phone bank with 12 different languages being spoken. So people who are don't speak English or Spanish in your community, um, can call that hotline and hopefully speak to someone who speaks their language to fill out um, the census form. You can't fill out a form for your client. 
and we're, we're going to have some more guidance on this, but basically a client can't come in and give you their form and say, you fill this out for me, and you go into your database and pull their LIHEAP information or whatever the case may be uh, to fill out the form. They have to do it themselves, uh, but there will be ways that you can assist them in that process. Um, accessibility issues, again, right, so people might not be literate, literate they might not be able to read, um, they might not be able to see, they might be blind. Um, if there are accessibility issues, there are multiple ways that we can fill out these forms. And something I haven't touched upon is that there, um, the census has different plans in place for all kinds of populations. So they have a plan for homeless populations. Uh, they have a plan for people who are living um, in group settings, so dorm rooms, prisons, um, domestic violence shelters. Uh, those people will be counted um, through the administration of those, those entities. Um, although that's a question, for the census purposes, anyone who is at college gets counted in their dorm because that's where they sleep, not in their home, even though they are still a part of a, a, a family household elsewhere. Um, jails, people are counted in the county within they reside. So uh, if you have a jail in your county, all of those inmates are counted in your community. Um, Okay. Does anybody have any questions right now? Okay, I see one from April. Are there penalties if people don't answer their door? Yes, there's actually a $100 fine if you do not fill out your census form. Um, I believe the last time the, lot, the fine was levied was in 1970, um, but the fine does exist. So, yes, that, that is something that is definitely a stick. I just wanted to elaborate other, on that just because um, yeah, please I do. feel like the question is a little bit broad. I mean, yeah, the, uh, there, is a, an, it is, there is an attached penalty for not filling out the census because it is a constitutionally mandated, um, it's a constitutional mandate to fill the census form, and so they do have a punishment attached to it. But um, what does happen if you don't answer your door is um, if you don't respond um, to the sort of request to fill out, um, to self-fill out your form by going online, they'll send someone to your door three times. Um, after that point, they'll start asking your neighbors. They'll have three more times where they'll ask neighbors or people that you might know about um, about your um, where you live and some of the, some of the questions that are asked in the form. After that point, they will turn to administrative records to get those questions answered, um, and so. It, when they kind of go down these lines, the, the likeliness of that information being accurate as you want to be represented is, is less and less. And so um, it's important to encourage, it's, I mean, definitely that there's a penalty, but even if, even if that penalty isn't level, like levy, because no one really actually is charged that fine, there is a risk of having your information not be accurate by um, refusing to fill the form as well. Great, thank you. Are there more questions for us right now? Okay, feel free to send them over to us and we'll answer them if there are more. Um, we, we, right now, CA Partnership is our Twitter handle. Um, this month has been a little crazy because of something called Community Action Awareness Month. So uh, we've been a little busy, um, but next month we're going to start our communications plan. We're gonna launch that next, week, uh, next month um, where we have our own Twitter handle and we're gonna set up our social media stuff. Um, so we'll, we will be um, sending out uh, links to sign up for things and, and we'll send out emails to when we are, are ready to launch some of those things so you can come up and follow us. Um, all right, the question I have is, can the census be filled out on people's phones in case they don't have high-speed access? I believe that, yes, it is a web browser friendly for a mobile phone. Um, I think that that is, I certainly hope that that is, is the case, but I'm, I'm, Eliza, do you know for sure? I would be yeah, sure if it wasn't. Yeah, you're right. It's, people can use their phones. Um, and, and actually, right. a, a, lot, a thing that um, the census will be doing is when the enumerators are sent out, they'll be using tablets. So it'll be the, sim, a similar yeah. sort of software. But yeah, phones. Uh, there's not going to be another question that was asked another time, um, just with if, if there will be a census app. There'll be no app, it'll still be the website that you have to go to, but you can't access that through through your phone um, anywhere that you right. have Right, so internet. a web browser won't be on an application. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so to recap while you think of some more questions, uh, we'd like you to become a Census Bureau partner by going to their website and signing up. And um, we would like you to contact your regional office and let them know that you're interested in, in doing census work. Uh, find a complete count committee in your area, um, or you can form one of your own. Uh, recruit to fill census jobs. Again, anything we can do to put a friendly face on, on the census is really crucial. Uh, figure out who is your hard to count population and what messages will help break through for them and train your staff and your colleagues on how to encourage census participation. We're waiting for more questions as those come through. Um, in the meantime, we're pretty easy to find. Well, I hope to be. Um, we hope to be pretty accessible about this. Um, so email us, we love email. Um, if you've seen me out in the field, I'm, I pass out my cell phone number. Um, it's on my cards. Call me, text me. Um, there's no silly question, there's no stupid question for sure. Uh, we want to answer everything out there, and, and something that you ask might be really helpful for, for someone else on, on the network. Um, next question, can you send us the PowerPoint? Yes, yeah, we will be emailing this around for sure. This yep. is kind of some of the questions that we're seeing um, are, I think a number of people are interested in how they would be able to contact their state complete count committee or some of the state points of contact. Um, mm -hmm. Answer, answer for us to connect people to, yeah. to these yeah. points. We, have, we, we currently have some resources. We're pulling more together. Um, and as those become available, we will be sending those around um, so you can access the people who are doing this work in, in your state and hopefully in your county, your city, um, those sorts of things. We are, we're pulling that information together. Um, if you have specific questions, you can feel free to email me and I will, I'll, I'll research it for you and send back a, an individual answer, but we are working on a, on a statewide, um, United States-wide plan. Um, so for those of you, um, most of you will probably recognize Will Dupree. She did um, training and technical assistance for us. Um, we only get her a few hours a week, but she's a fabulous resource for us. Liza has been with the partnership for three years. Um, she was a VISTA and she works with um, Gerald and Tiffany on both of their programs. Um, so I'm really pleased to have her because she's a wealth of information for me. Uh, I am full time on the project. Um, so I'm, I'm spearheading it and, and I do most of the travel right now, but we're sending Liza and Will out there too. Um, but any of us can answer questions um, and we all are, are accessible. Jim, Jim Masters um, and Alan Stansbury. Jim, um, so I'm sure many of you know, um, he's out in California. And he does, uh, his company is the Center for Community Futures. He is our consultant. He is also out there doing training for us. Um, if you would like us to come train for your state, you can also let us know, um, invite us to come out. We can't do all of them, but we certainly want to know if you want us to be there because uh, we will be traveling quite a bit. So please uh, reach out for that. Um, Jim and Ellen are both traveling the country and doing PowerPoints, but, and they're also well read. Um, they know more about this than probably any two people should. So they've got a wealth of knowledge as well. So when I don't know the answer, um, sometimes Jim does, um, or Eliza finds it for me, or Eliza knows. So we are resources um, that are available for you, and we want to be here to answer any questions and, and take any ideas that you have. Um, these are the last two slides. So we are three minutes till, um, well, to where I am. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Well, we're going to leave this up for a couple more minutes so you can make sure you can re reach out to us. Uh, we will be sending this out. And we welcome and questions. And also we'll be posting this webinar. We have recorded the webinar and we'll be posting these slides to our website as well so you can access it there. Great. Um, uh, question, how do we sign up for census-specific email notifications from the partnership? Catherine, you just did. Um, <laughs> we will also have an email form um, up on our website soon. But people who have attended our, our speeches on the, the census so far, we're going to add you automatically. Um, but there will be a, a sign-up link on our website in the next couple of weeks. Okay. All right, Liza, anything else? Oh, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining. We've got about um, 
I had about 90 or 100 people. So, uh, you know, as far as getting the, the network activated, it seems like we do have um, interest. So our goal is just to keep building on this and make sure that we're talking to everybody we know and all the people that we serve just about how important it is to get counted. So thanks so much for tuning in a year out. We're excited to build yeah. on that. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.